Welcome to the Troy Kearns Podcast. We talk all things real estate, business, entrepreneurship. Today, I've got a very special guest, someone who I have had the pleasure of mentoring for the last seven or eight months. And now he's one of our junior coaches in the Millionaire Mentorship Program. And coincidentally enough, we also both pay, played Major League Baseball together. Ryan, <laughs> obviously that last yeah. part. Yeah, I think that last about, part's in your it's last part in your dreams, but you know, I think uh I think you're intense there. Yeah, yeah. So uh I was never a major league baseball player. Um I admire the fact that you were able to get to such a high level. I've always said that if you have that sort of intensity and drive, then there, there, there's no reason you can't beat me in the future here. Um Ryan, the the purpose of this show is for people who are listening right now, a lot of these people are either, you know, thinking about getting started and in real estate, they're thinking about business, they're thinking about finance. They're kind of maybe where you were eight months ago where they don't know which direction they want to go, how they're going to get there. And I want to talk about your story. First of all, let's talk about baseball, man, because that's a big part of your story. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Southern California area, just outside of Los Angeles. So a lot of competitive sports and mainly baseballs around there. So I just grew up playing ball my whole life. So when you said I grew up playing ball my whole life, where did that come from? Did that come from your father, your mother? Was it a combination of, of both? Very so much, a, very much so a, com- a combination of both. My mom played D1 softball as a pitcher. She did, still does pitching lessons on the side. My older sister played D1 softball as well, still does some pitching lessons on the side. So the sport was always in my blood. The passion and the education of the sport came from my dad, though. He didn't really have a father figure that was in the picture. Um, I knew baseball was always his passion. He never had the opportunity to pursue it fairly, but I know when he had a son, that was his, that was one of his main goals. And from the time I was two, three years old, we'd be on the beach with our camper playing wiffle ball, just him and I for hours and hours. So that's kind of where my passion started. And then he was kind of there every step of the way. And I can't even tell you how many hours we spent in the cage together, just, just working and grinding and competing most importantly. So pretty, pretty cool upbringing there. Now, now let me ask you, When did it become apparent to you that you were going to make it to the next level? Like, where were you at at the middle school level? And then where did it go to the high school level? And then I know you were a duck. Um, Where did, how did that whole transpire? Were you like, because, you know, I'm, I'm friends with other guys who pursued that career and none of them made it to where you made it. And that's a very, very small club of people who have major made it to major league baseball. Yeah, I think for me, when I was coming up, I played with the same group of kids for the most part, whether it was Pony League or that transcribed into a a club team. So we'd be playing year round together with the most part. I think I started to separate myself as it turned into kid pitch. It was a lot of coach pitch early on. It turned into kid pitch and I was a pitcher and a hitter. And I was one of the few kids that throw strikes. I was able to compete and almost take over the game on both sides of the ball. And I think that's where I started to recognize that I had a little bit different skill set than most. And then as I got older, um, I think I always stood out on the field, whether it was for pitching or for hitting or for defense, whatever it was, maybe not the necessarily the best player all the time on the field, but I would end up being the best player. So I think that was something that was instilled in me that I was competing my competing against not only my teammates, but the opposing team. And I wanted to make myself stand out at every step of the way. So that same simple thought process carried me all the way through the minor leagues and into the major leagues. And I think the minor leagues is where I first realized how challenging it was to stay at the top of that competition field because you have worldwide competition at that point and people that have individual upbringings and stories and guys that literally have nothing to, nothing to lose. So it was interesting. And then the big leagues is a whole different beast. You know, as I, as I try to coach my son in basketball and I'm not expecting him to be any sort, he says, I'm going to play pro football. And I'm just like, yeah, okay. Um, but, uh, you know, as I'm trying to be that good father, there's like a psychopath in there too. And I think you probably met him before. And I, I'm just wondering what, what words of encouragement, this is for my own purposes, what words of, and you've met Conrad, you've met my daughter, Scarlett, and you gave him, you were kind enough to come over and give him a signed baseball card. And they, they, they I actually just funny enough, I gave him my whole baseball collection, which I'm like, dude, he's like, I want to buy a, a motorcycle. I'm like, dude this is all the cards I've held for, you know, 35, 37 years. I'm 45 now. And I, he's like, God, I look up the Bo Jackson. It's worth 200 bucks. And I'm like, yeah, sell it. <laughs> Put it on eBay and sell it. But like, 
I, I'm struggling to connect with my son because I want it so bad for him. How, what were those words of encouragement that from your father that got you to want to want it for yourself? I think the biggest thing was never being satisfied. And that was, it's oddly enough, that's something that really hindered me as I developed as into a young professional, into a major leaguer. I feel like I never learned how to fail properly. Meaning when I would fail, there's always learning lessons within those moments. Failure was always just failure when I was growing up and success was always had layers to it. Whenever you succeeded, there was always things you can do better at. But whenever I failed, it was just failure. So as I got older, I had to learn what failure meant and pretty much how to understand the important pieces of that failure and not just let it consume me that failure is failure. And that's all it means. Failure means, okay, what did I do wrong there? What could I have controlled in that moment to make myself better? And I think those are words of encouragement that I share a lot now with young athletes is when adversity happens, when when failure happens, because it will happen, how do we respond? You have to be able to have the perspective within that moment to understand what happened. And if you had control over what happened, how can we make sure that does not happen again? And if you didn't have control over what happened to create that failure, you have to learn how to accept that and be able to trust your process and repeat it, knowing that the results may not always be in your favor. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Make sure you give us a five-star review. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you share this podcast with a friend and make sure that you schedule a call with me and my team. We have the Millionaire Mentorship Program. This is for newbie and advanced investors to get started investing in real estate. And if you're listening to this podcast right now, that's exactly what you want, right? You want to learn how to invest in real estate. It's changed my life. It can change your life. And we have a program that'll help you get your first or next investment property within the next 90 days, or I'll pay you $1,000 cash and you don't pay. Guess what else we're launching? We're launching a fund. And if you're interested, I'll include a link in my bio to this fund where you can actually invest with me on a lot of the properties that we're in. In fact, I'm in one of my properties right now in downtown Kansas City in a building that I bought using my own money, but I started with just one property and you can do the exact same thing that I did, but you gotta get started, you gotta take action. So whether you wanna invest with me in my fund or whether you wanna schedule a call with my team, both those links are in the bio. Enjoy the show, give us a five-star review. Am I doing some things wrong? I'm the loudest guy in the freaking whole place. Like my, my son goes, I said, and I asked him this too, I said, and I appreciate you sharing all that. Um, I asked him, I'm like, do you want me to stop screaming? Cause you know, I, we, and we, this is a conversation I'm sure that you've had. I was like, he's like, well, my coach says not that. I said, your dad is with you through the whole process, through everything. And the coaches are going to tell you a lot of nonsense here and a lot of nonsense there. And I asked him, like, do you want me to stop screaming like a lunatic? Cause he says, I can hear you over all the coaches. Was that something that your dad did or how did he hang back? Or did he, I mean, did he just work on you a lot off the field or how did he play a part in your success? So he went from being a head coach when I was really young to probably right around Conrad's age where you're starting to get the itch as a young boy of of starting to love the game and understanding the passion and the competition. And my dad started to step back as the assistant coach. And what that turned into was a lot of more one-on-one time. You actually recently posted a video on your Instagram of him doing dribble uh, drill work. And I actually really like that because for me, the moments that I remember the most and that were the most impactful was one-on-one with my dad. He'd be throwing BP to me in the cage. He'd be throwing any pitch he wants. And he always wasn't the best pitcher. He didn't always know it was going. It got to a point where I had to wear a helmet in the cage because <laughs> Lord knows he wasn't afraid to hit me because he wasn't going to take anything off. So I, I enjoyed the fact that he taught me how to compete on a one-to-one me versus you basis to remove all of the distractions. And it just allowed us to compete. And honestly, that's what bonded us most importantly over it all. He was never the big screamer on the field. He was not afraid to walk out to the mound and excuse my language, but he would say, if you walk one more effing guy, Ryan, I'm going to drag you off of this field and we're going to find a new team to play for. It was something to that regards where like it was the fear factor, but it wasn't the embarrassment factor of showing me up in front of all my peers and other parents, because you have something that Conrad does not in this moment. And that's perspective on the large scale of that moment. He doesn't have perspective on what that moment means. He only has perspective on him playing in that moment. Right. Yeah. And and I've noticed that the thing that I've struggled with, and you probably faced as an athlete, is like 
he went from being a dog robot where he was after everything to overthinking everything and trying to blend in. And I'm like, dude, just get back to who you were. Like, you know, and have, did you ever f- find yourself regressing in, in athletics to overthinking things? A million percent. That's actually something that probably progressed my retirement is you get to the highest of levels and there is so much information available to you that if you don't know how to process what is impactful for yourself, noise just becomes noise and then the noise turns into distractions and now you forget who you are in that moment. Right. That's, that's, that's wise wisdom. So when you got to the major leagues, um, obviously that was probably a super exciting moment for you and you're proud, you're, Family's proud. Um, who did you sign with? I got drafted by the Oakland A's. I was fortunate enough to come up with them through their farm system. And I got all the way to double A in 2015. And then 2016 is when things got exciting. I ended up repeating double A after having a pretty good season. All my friends that I'd been roommate, rooming with, playing with for the last two, three seasons, they all progressed to triple A. And I had two choices at that moment. I could have folded been frustrated, said I'm getting screwed, and just been another name in the hat. Instead, I took it personally. I decided that I was going to be the one to control my destiny and remove all of the noise and immerse myself in my process and my plan and execute my step-by-step process one day at a time. And I took myself from double A that year. I was there for six weeks. I absolutely raked. I hit about 330 with eight homers in six weeks, went to triple A, took playing time away from some buddies and other older guys that got traded the year before to the team that there were higher prospects, took playing time away from them, hit about 310 with six homers in six weeks there, went to the future of all-star game, which is right before the major league all-star game in San Diego, where they take the top one or two prospects from each team. So it's the entire minor league baseball they're pulling the top all-stars from. So I played on that in San Diego. And then I ended up debuting with the A's the second half of the season I played 76 out of 77 games and really never looked back. So when you, when you got drafted, did they call you? Did you know you were getting drafted by the Oakland Athletics? When you, when you're in that farm system, is it like you're just, you're staying in that farm system and you have the choice of staying with them or if another offer comes along, um, you would take that offer. So during the draft process, you got teams calling you throughout those draft days, telling you, You know, if you're available here, we might take you here. Would you take this amount of money? Vice versa. It just kind of happens every different team. And sometimes the team says we're taking the next pick and then they wouldn't. So it's really a crapshoot. So the A's called. They told me they were taking me at 100 if I was still there. Ended up going. It was awesome. And then going through the minor leagues, you're committed to a six-year minor league contract. So if you spend a full six years in minor leagues and you still don't make the major leagues, you become a minor league free agent. And then anytime that you get called up to the major leagues, they put you on the 40-man roster, kind of reset your clock. Now you have another six years in the big leagues. What position were you known for? What positions did you play and end up playing in the major leagues? I played about an equal amount of first and third in the major leagues. And then I DH some as well. I was more of a natural first baseman. Um, The third base adds some versatility to me and gave me more playing opportunity. So ended up doing that quite a bit. First baseman is like you're busy in every 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 hitting cycle because you're either taking a grounder uh, inside and running over the base. You might be taking a a short fly ball. And in most situations, you're going to be getting a ball thrown at you at how many miles per hour? Man, we got infielders in the big leagues throwing the ball 100 plus mile an hour across the diamond. And sometimes it's sinking. Sometimes it's cutting. Sometimes they short hop it. It's uh, the higher you got in the ranks, the better the arms got. And uh, it was, it was interesting. And he told me uh, when we talked about this in Alabama, and we'll get into more about Alabama later, but I asked you, I said, how many of the mistakes that you made, the errors you make, were you you think were mental? And you told me 99.9% of the errors I made were mental. And I believe that's the same for everybody, because at some point in time, you've got it all. And you really, it's all muscle memory. You react, right? When the, when it, when he throws you a, a fast, uh, across the diamond uh, from third base and it skids at your feet, you know, you can just pick it up, right? Like, so the mental game of baseball is the most important game, part of the game. Would you agree? Yeah. And then we kind of backtrack to what you mentioned earlier about Conrad overthinking what he's doing in the game. At first base, I played that position my entire life. So I knew any play, any situation that could potentially happen in any moment. I was prepped. I was ready. I lived it. 
third base was different. I haven't played third base a ton. So that I only experience consistent third base at the professional level. The higher you get, the faster the game gets at the big league level. The game is so fast. The guys are hitting the ball so hard. If you don't have every possible scenario pre-pitched in your head, knowing that you can execute it, that's when things speed up on you. All of a sudden you find yourself thinking about the wrong thing. Balls hit at you, routine ground ball, you kick it or you field it. You're thinking about your throwing position, your arm slot thrown across a diamond. You might miss a little high runner safe. So things like that compound. And that's where the mental errors at third base definitely, definitely hurt. So you, you had it, you had a career. Uh, what teams did you play with? I ended up playing two seasons in the big leagues with the A's two with the Mariners and then one season with the Brewers. And then I played in Korea for one season as well. What team did you like playing with the most and why? I think the A's just because it's such a, I hear this from a lot of guys, the team that drafts them, the team they come up with, it's such a comfort with the personnel that are around anywhere from the minor league clubbies to the, the major league strength coaches and athletic trainers. You see a lot of the same faces for numerous spring trainings. You know that their intent is to invest in you as a player. Sometimes when you go to a new team, it's, it's strictly numbers. Your results are dictating your job instead of, intangibles, different things that they might value about you as an individual that adds value to that roster and that team. So have you, have, have you read the book about uh, what is it? What's the book about the Oakland athletics where their famous general manager, I think it's Billy. Bean, oh, Moneyball. Yeah. Moneyball. Yeah. I've read the book and I've seen the movie numerous times at this point. And was that still, were those concepts accurate? Were they still being practiced in Oakland? I can't say that they were actively preached on a day-to-day basis. I think the teams that I was on coming up was always their high prospect teams. So they kind of let us play. There was definitely things that they emphasized, but for where the minor leagues is at now with how much information they're providing to these young men to where it was when I was coming up, it's very different. We were just kind of able to play and we were successful. We won. And that's probably why we didn't get a whole lot of specific feedback. But I know that currently that's definitely what they emphasize. What's the, what's the thing that made you happiest about playing in Major League Baseball? Proving to yourself that a pipe dream is is something that is obtainable. And right. it forces you to tr- believe in something bigger than you and bigger than your mind could ever fathom. And right. knowing that if you if you repeat the right things enough times, and if you stack enough of the small wins all the way down to what my offseason diet was, making a decision between having in and out for lunch or having that chicken and brown rice that I prepped, it was it was controlling what I can control within a very large scale. And to have that come together, I know you feel a lot of the same feelings about your real estate portfolio and your successes is seeing something from start to finish and knowing that you have that in you to be able to execute. Right. And what did you not like about it? the most. Man, I felt like when the blinders were taken off, ignorance was bliss until I learned about the business side of it and how many things are out of my control that affect my livelihood. And I think as I got married, as I had kids, as I moved around more, you start having decisions out of your control affect more than just you. And I think that was one of the more challenging things was the emotions that you wouldn't just feel yourself, but then the emotions that the people around you that loved you felt as well and how it affected right. them. It, it became bigger than just me and my career. And I think that was the hardest part. The blinders were taken off. I started seeing that and it was, it was challenging. Yeah. Cause I imagine you're hundred percent focused on the game when you're in the game and, and you're not thinking about anything else now from like w- when you decided that baseball was over for you. And I know you've told me on multiple occasions, you could have played, you know, all around the country, all around the world and kept a career going. But at some point in time, you decided that, Hey, um, I want to be with my family. I want to start a next chapter of my life. What what attracted you to real estate? Was there anything else that you tried out before real estate? Or did you just kind of say, man, this is a good place to go and I want to get into this? I would kind of say I stumbled upon real estate. I was always really into it. I always really believed in it because I knew that if you were willing to play the long game was something you had the control over making it a winning or losing deal. So for me, when I had hip surgery in 2019, that's when I first started my research. I read a book by the name of Kathy Fedke talking about, you know, retiring with rentals. And I ended up going out and connecting with an old pitching coach from from high school who was managing about 25 to 50 rental properties in North Carolina. So my my one of my best friends and I, we went out there with him, saw the whole operation, met his team on the ground there, walked away buying three houses. 
And this is back when I had a really good W-2 job. Getting a loan was good. Locked in a sub four interest rate. Uh, different formula than what I'm even trying to attack now, but right. just the process of putting my money into an asset, having that asset pay me, and now seeing what that asset is even worth three years later without me really doing a ton of rehab to the project, it is proven to me that I have control over a winning and losing deal. Obviously, when you buy a deal, that's where you have your best opportunity to win. But right. if I'm forced to sell a property when the market is down, I don't have control over if it, of it being a winner or loser. If I am making money off that property, even if it's $100 a month, I still have the equity in there and I have control and the ability to wait to sell the property when the market is stronger and I can turn that deal into a winner. So I wanted to interrupt you in this podcast and just take a quick moment to tell you two things. Number one, we do this for free for you. I haven't made a nickel on social media at all. I'm doing this to provide you enough value. So all I'm asking for you to do is share it and give us a five-star review. It'll totally help us out and I really appreciate it. The other thing, if you want more free resources like our free Facebook group, it's Millionaire Mentorship Real Estate Investing on Facebook. All you gotta do is join it, it's free. It doesn't cost anything and there's lots of resources there and we'll definitely give you those for free, no charge. Here's the other thing. If you're serious about investing in real estate and you're ready to take action, I have a program. No matter where you're at in your real estate journey, I can help you out. I don't care if you've got five houses, 10 houses, no houses, 100 houses. I've got something that I can share with you that's going to make you a lot of money. And if you want to become financially free and you're brand new to real estate investing, this is the absolute thing you want to do. And here's the thing. What I've learned from most of my students right now is that it's not just an investing program. It's a mindset program. We're going to change the way you think about money. If you want to start investing, make sure you schedule a call with me and my team and let's get the ball rolling. Guess what else? If you are like, man, I don't got the time and I make tons of money, I just enjoy listening to what you're gonna say, that's cool too. We actually have set up a fund where you can invest with us, but you gotta be an accredited investor. If you wanna find out what that looks like, all you gotta do is click the link in my bio, fill out the form, it takes you about two seconds, and then we'll let you know about the deals that we're doing. We're doing big deals in Kansas City. And this year, I think we'll do two huge deals in Kansas City. I'm looking at a few right now and I want you to be a part of it. And if you've got more money than time, then that's what you should do. If you've got more time than money, then schedule a call with me and my team and we'll get you in our coaching program so that you can have more money than time. For, for people who are, uh, you know, either listening to your story right now, obviously make sure you guys subscribe, make sure you guys share, make sure you guys you know, give Ryan a five-star review for him sharing a story with you. But for people who are brand new and, and you've got, you know, some deals under your belt right now and you're, and you're really, really kind of just getting started on things, what would you say to somebody who's just starting off or they're thinking about getting started? What would you tell them? Educate yourself. I think that was what drew me to you so much and why I joined the Million Millionaire Mentorship Group was you had so much free knowledge out there on the internet between YouTube, your podcast, your social media platforms. If you just have some sort of work ethic, go do some research by yourself, figure out who that person is. Are they offering up quality information? Do some due right. diligence. When you buy a property, you do your due diligence. When you are hiring a mentor or signing out with a mentor, do your due diligence. And the biggest challenge for me was filtering through the million opportunities that real estate holds to what yeah. I really wanted to do. And I spent a lot of time doing things that I didn't love and I right. didn't know it until I did it. So I think right. I finally filtered down my strategies to something that I'm passionate about, that I believe in, that I know if I do long enough, it's going to get me exactly where I want to go. So what have you learned so far in real estate since you've been investing, I mean, at least for the last eight months with me. And then prior to that, you said in North Carolina. There is an endless list of that. I'll try and stay focused on what you emphasize, which is finding deals. If you become a deal finder, whether it's in your current market or out of the state, there's always a buyer for a good deal. So for me, you've helped me emphasize how do I find good deals? And that can be on market. That's fine. I spend a lot of time on market because the out-of-state investing is challenging to have systems and systems in place to find the off-market deals consistently. We're working on that to make that better, more consistent. But there's ways to analyze properties that are on market. 
um, and find a strategy that works for you. If you have a full-time job, maybe wholesaling is what makes the most sense for you because it's the best way to make some money now. All you have to do is really find deals and the buyers are essentially will come to you. Yes, you'll grow your buyers list and such. Maybe you don't have a full-time job. You have a little more flexibility. Maybe you want to be a fix and flipper. I started there because I wanted to see what that process felt like to do the construction. I probably didn't buy the best deals. I mean, I know I didn't buy the best deals based off of the exits and such, but I, I took action and I did it and I made some money along the way. It was never life-changing, but now I know more now than I did then. That's for sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, that just goes to your ability to do, right? Like I always tell everybody, if you don't just, if you sit and overanalyze everything and just don't do anything, even if you, and I just got off the phone with my attorney on a deal that like it, I may uh, lose this silly case. And it's like, and she's like, well, are you mad? And it's it somebody else. Actually, she was like, well, I'm like, I, no, I'm not mad. Like, because I'm learning. And like, even if it costs me money to learn, like you just mentioned there, sometimes that le learning lesson is going to make you 10 times what it costs you in time and energy and money. And watching you in the Zoom calls when you were um, caulking the tops of the stuff like that showed me that you were into it. And I think, and just for those of you guys listening right now, it's not like he went in there trying to do the work himself. He just realized that the only person that he could count on was himself. And so he just realized that he had to finish the job. And sometimes that's what it takes. But those, those lessons teach you is kind of a little bit therapy. And this goes back to my, my baseball mindset of how do I find what I have control over in this equation and put all of my energy into that and stop giving these contractors that don't show up, don't return my calls, do crappy work. How do I control a part of this equation? I knew right. I could do the work. That was never the issue. But right. I didn't sign on with the millionaire mentorship to grow, to learn how to be a general contractor. Right. If I wanted to do that, I probably would have went a different route. But that was never my goal with this within right. this equation. But it got to the point where I was so frustrated and with things out of my control that I had to internalize and refocus on what did you have control over? I turned into a general contractor for four to six weeks. I was on the job site for easily four to eight hours a day, just doing things myself. And yeah, I made mistakes. Yeah, I, I saved some money, but I cost myself some time. But I was able to take the power back, which was the most freeing feeling in that entire rehab process. Right. And now that you've got a few deals under your belt, where where do you see yourself going in the long term and in the in the immediate future? The immediate future is staying in the out of state investing while Phoenix kind of figures out itself. I think this is something you and I have spoken a lot about. Is you know your success in Mississippi, you've really pushed me hard to Birmingham, and I've probably had some shiny object syndrome along the way with some Airbnb stuff, some arbitrage, some other markets that I might have had access to. You've really helped me filter down my thought process to Birmingham. So now I'm 110% there. I am right. offering every Monday. I was actually just submitting offers before we hopped on this call. So every Monday I'm following up on offers from last week. I'm submitting new offers, just, just adding, adding properties to the, the docs to be able to start that process and start scaling. The long term, I see more of a multifamily, maybe even commercial space that's down the road. I want to be able to stack a ton of these rental properties, specifically Section 8 rentals. And then I'd love to be able to sell off some, some portfolios. So maybe three homes here for this cap rate, be able to do some 1031 exchanges into some bigger, better stuff. But I really like the process like you mentioned of Monopoly. I'm stacking all the little greenhouses so I can big buy the big red ones. Yeah, and I feel like me going down that route of the Monopoly is always how I felt and how I think thought of things in my mind. But I think it allows people to relate because everybody's played Monopoly and they and they realize that they don't start at Boardwalk because they'll go broke. They start at Baltic Avenue and they buy a house there or they try to get full acquisition Monopoly on that particular area. And then they realize that, wow, once I control the block, I can control the rents and I can do this and I can do that. And it's pretty cool. And that's why I think the shiny object syndrome is, 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 is the case for everybody, right? Like everybody, there's always a bigger, better deal. There's always something that sounds more attractive than it is, but what ends up happening is you distract your time. It's like, Hey, I'm going to be a pitcher. I'm going to be a third baseman. I'm going to be the DH and I'm going to be the outfielder. And you know what? I will also be the sports medicine guy. 
And you can't do any of those things. You can't be, you can't do any of those things. Well, what you can do well is focus. And, and, and just like you mentioned earlier is repetition is the key to success. And how do you get your reps in? You get your reps in by buying those little greenhouses and learning it one at a time. Now let's talk about, um, something that we talked about a little bit before, before the podcast, you had mentioned, uh, you did some deals. Um, you, you brought on some partners in Birmingham and we, we went met down there. I went to, I was in Mississippi. I said, I'll come meet you up in Birmingham. I drove up to Birmingham to meet you. Um, I beat you up enough about the rest. So I won't bring that part up, but, uh, uh <laughs> yeah, they can find yeah. it on YouTube if they want to see it. Yeah. They want to see it. So, um, when we talked, I had mentioned that I didn't believe that your people that you partnered with were being as forthcoming with information as I felt partners should be. And um, where are you at with that deal right now? So they just got the appraisal. I'm waiting to see the documents on that. So once I get the appraisal number, we'll start discussing the exit of getting me out of there. The goal right now is get my money back as fast as I can to move on to the next deal. And they can have that property and I can move on. Uh, the way that this whole whole situation happened, I felt like, I felt like I still made the right decision. I don't regret where I'm at now. Um, right. I think I'm definitely learning that a partnership is the most challenging thing in real estate because you don't always have people that have the same goals or values in a, in a deal. So now my partnerships moving forward will make sure that it's pretty clear cut what the opportunities are because I, I still see a lot of value in the partnerships, but I was doing it as a security blanket and a safety net for myself. And it's ended up biting me in the ass more than I ever anticipated and saw. I can only see so far ahead without doing. So now that I see the other side of the equation, my perspective is a little bit different. I should have took that deal on myself because I could have had more control over this moment right now. Right. And I think that, you know, seeing is believing that when we went down there and I ended up buying a property because I was trying to find you one. And I was like, eh, that's cool. This, this, you know, I've always, like, I felt strong enough in the market. So I told you, you know, whatever's going to happen, is going to happen. Um, and then it's kind of cool because you were actually with me when I found the contractor who's new work, now working on the house. And um, it'll be exciting to see how that thing turns out. Right. It'll be exciting to see what happens and how many properties we end up buying in Birmingham. Yeah. A part of me regrets not buying the one that you did, but I knew in my heart, the worst case scenario was getting you invested in that market. It was going to help bring us closer together. And it was also going to help me take on that market that much faster. So I don't regret passing out on that deal because I'm happy that you're in that market with me. And if anything, you're going to be more competition for me and it's going to be exciting. Yeah. You know, with markets that big, there's really no competition. There's like, I'm not actively even looking at it right now. I, I literally made that offer for you. And then you're like, yeah. So do I want to be more involved in Birmingham? Absolutely. But I've told you, and I think this goes down to focus is I only have so many hours in the day. And until I find the right property manager, the right situation, or we find it together, then it's one of those things that I'll just, I'll get the first one done. Then I'll find a property manager and then we'll look into scaling there as things progress. I do like Alabama. I do think it's a good market. I do think Birmingham, I think Mobile, I think uh, Huntsville, I think all of those markets in Alabama are good markets. I think that the Southeast, the Midwest is where people are going to continue to find better values for the real estate. I think the West Coast is too expensive. I think there's too many regulations. I think there's too many rules. I think California sucks. I think Arizona is pretty tough to make money in because, uh, you know, of just the inflated price of housing. Nevada, the same way. We know that Las Vegas and Phoenix share a lot of similarities. You know, one of the things we rely on, if you're if you're listening to this program right now and you're enjoying what Ryan has to say, one of the things that we rely on is you to spread the word. And how you spread the word is by obviously liking the video, by giving us a five-star review and sharing the video with somebody else who may get value out of this because we do it for free. And the reason we do it for free is we feel this, this is 100% true. Is we provide enough free value for people. They'll realize that, man, the value that I am going to get by signing up with Troy's coaching program is going to be even more so than what he's provided for free because he's already done that. From you being a past student and current junior coach, can you speak on our program a little bit and what you learned from the program? I can't say enough good, obviously. Uh, I'm biased because you know I wanted to stick around so much that I asked you about 15,000 times to be a junior coach, and here I am. So 
I, I knew when I signed up with you initially that this was a program that I wanted to grow with and be a part of long term, mostly because I've seen enough coaching programs out there from the outside looking in of how they're structured, a few on the inside looking out, but seeing how they're structured and seeing how they scale. I knew that was always going to be you because I knew where your mindset was at and where you wanted to take this. One thing that I loved the most was there was never an opportunity to not get a hold of you. I think I called you the other night on Friday night for the first time and I, you missed my call and it was late. It was past dinner there probably. And you ended up texting me first thing in the morning. You're up at 5 a.m. You text me. That was the only time you have not picked up a phone call of mine. And it wasn't even for a deal. It was just to catch up on some of the, the mentor, the mentees and, uh, and talking about a situation that we're, we're discussing. But like the, I called you, I had a potential buyer for one of my mobile homes that I flipped. I met her on the site. She told me this whole scenario about how she was losing her house. She was selling it. The, the right. 72 soul didn't do it. I was sitting in the appointment for an hour and a half and I called you on a whim. You picked up, you had windshield time. You were driving from somewhere to somewhere. And you spoke to this lady for probably 20, 25 minutes, breaking down the situation for me, realizing that it wasn't a good deal and explained to me after the fact why it wouldn't work. And that was after the two hour plus class calls that you do a week, it was still extra time that you were providing for us. Instead of you sending me an invoice after saying, Hey, you gave me an hour of my time. Here's four, or you owe me 400 bucks. Like it was just part of it because you cared more about my progression and my education than you did about your financial benefit. Yeah. And I'll just tell you this, like when you build something and, and I appreciate you saying that. And, and it means a lot to me because it, it's exactly what I wanted to be. I didn't want to be somebody that didn't care about people's success because they tell you in this, you know, the, you hear this over and over again. If you help enough people get to where they want to get, you're going to get exactly where you want to get. And where I want to get, I'm going to put it out there. And we've talked about this is I want to start a fund. I want to continue to grow this coaching program by training enough young guys like yourself, enough young guys to be able to pass on because what happens is, you know, a lot of those people who are brand new, I, I speak above them, right? Not at, not intentionally, but just like you going out there and throwing me pitches for a while. Like I'm not going to be able to hit the ball because you throw at such a high level that it, it's just different and you're just natural and you've been playing with guys who are in a different space. And so when I look at things, I'm like, you know, if I can help enough guys really build this culture of we're here to help people, we're here to, build people. And I'm not here to sell some 40, $50,000 program where like, it's just a big money grab. Like I had a guy that interviewed the other day for the mastermind to help me kind of with that. And he's like, dude, you can sell these things for a hundred grand. I'm like, man, you're not my guy. Like I'm not in there trying to like, because if you're selling something, it, the person has to want it bad enough that they're going to ask for it. And if they don't want it bad enough, I have found if you sell it hard enough, they're going to want their money back. Right. And, and you're going to give them their money back because you don't want to deal with them anymore. And um, we want people who are fans, who believe in themselves, who believe that real estate is the best path. And, but the reason what we're starting the other channels is one thing that I've noticed, and I think you've noticed this too, is that some people are just never going to take action. And they, but they like me and they like the program and they like what we talk about. They may want to be investors with us, but they don't want to be investors themselves. And we talked about that program and how that progresses. And I see you as a big part of that in terms of doing, um, you know, the syndications and building up things throughout that. And I'll be announcing the launch of my fund. I'd, I'd love to get your feedback on that actually on the spot right now, um, which is I was doing some brainstorming this week and I bought a couple of domain names like Kearns Capital. And then, I'm, and then I looked up, like what are the top like hundred uh, real estate investment funds? And none of them are named after some, I mean, a few of them, like maybe like 10 are named after last names, you know, cause I'm going after the whole Car Cardone capital, the Pineda capital, all the guys that I've kind of seen them break it out, but I'm looking at it and knowing that most people are not calling it by their last names. And then there's, then I remember the old boiler room, Stratton Oakmont and, and, and that whole thing, like, and that, so I looked up all these names, like what means strong granite, granite capital, you know, and, and diamond capital. Would you say, I mean, more people know diamonds than they know Kearns, right? More people know um, rocks than they know Kearns. 
So from an outside looking in on, on something that you're going to be a part of, how do you think we should name a fund? Should it be, what, what, what should it be based on? I love acronyms that have meaning beyond the name that you're seeing. So like a, a TKKC or something like that. Like, I don't know, maybe not that exactly, but something like that. Like I did one with my best friend, it's BCS Capital Management. And that's just a smaller fund to be able to help people get involved. And it stands for his two kids' first initials of their first names and my daughter's first name. So there's meaning beyond just the BCS, but it's simple right. enough that you're not sitting there advertising based off of your last name. It's just a name. And that's, you kind of want that to go by the wayside, but I think your brand is big enough that without needing to put Kerns on there, you are going to get enough investors involved. And it might be easier if your name's not attached to it directly, just for the sake of, oh, well, I don't know what Kerns is. So I don't, what does that mean? Like you, your brand is so big already that I think this being an individual niche of that isn't going to matter as much as you having your name all plastered all over it. Yeah, I thought that I actually thought about Kansas City Capital because I like that that name. But then I was like, well, people are going to just think we're in Kansas City. And, you know, you do like so. a, TK, a, TK, a TKC Capital, T- Troy, Kansas yeah. City, Troy, Currency. Well, I mean, you could do a million different variations of what it is, but then it's just TKC. Yeah, we'll have to you think do about a cool logo off that. Guys, in the comments, let us know what should we call the capital? I've looked up every diamond every granite every like every word that means like fidelity trust those have all been taken like 10 different ways like trust capital partners and all these things but i'd love to know i definitely want it to have meaning but i've made some naming mistakes in the past um the channel troy kern's channel they're like mm-hmm. uh what's the channel i'm like well we got a bunch of different places <laughs> like yeah just call it your name ryan um as we wrap things up what is one piece of advice that you could give somebody who's new or somebody who's trying to get started or somebody who maybe is struggling like mentally right now about what their next move is? And what, what would you tell them right now? You know, I'm going to revert this back to you, to something that you said to me when I was in Kansas City for your mastermind. And situations get hard, investments get hard, individual properties get hard. You told me that there was never a project that you started that you did not finish. And for me, that is such a deep thought process, but such a simply executed one, because if you're able to comprehend that when you start something, you're going to finish it, that's the commitment that you're making to yourself. And that's the mindset that I've had my entire life because of baseball. I started that journey. I was going to finish it, whether it was the smallest thing. I started this workout. I'm going to finish it. I started this run, this 10 mile run that I'm on. I'm going to finish it. I started this flip that is already going south. I'm going to finish it because that's just what I do. When you boil it down to just a character trait like that, there's no negotiating with yourself. There's no, let me negotiate with myself and figure out terms that maybe make sense for both sides. There's no both sides. It's just you. So if you're stuck, if you're stuck at a, a portion of your journey where you feel like you're bottlenecked and you don't know how to get through it, Use resources to your advantage. Use mentors to your advantage to help yourself progress because you made the commitment to start this journey. Don't quit just because it got hard. If that's going to be what you're teaching yourself, envision yourself if you don't have children, envision yourself having children. What's the life lesson that you want to instill into those children as they deal with controversy and and you know struggles as they progress in life? You want to teach them that you can finish this or you are going to finish this because you started this. We can reevaluate, we recalibrate, reevaluate down the road, but don't negotiate with yourself to figure out a way out of this right now. Awesome. And that's, that, that is awesome. That is, I'm glad that that made such an impact on you. I didn't even, when I said it, I didn't even think it would be, but I wish I could do the same things in the gym. (laughs) Uh, You know what I mean? Like when you said that, I'm like, oh man, I've definitely negotiated with myself in in the, uh, in the diet and the gym thing. But I think that's something that, you know, you're, you know, you constantly want to improve yourself and I constantly trying to improve myself. Um, everybody wants, and there's to- things like there's things you're going to sacrifice to be able to do. Like for me, like my, my working out and my diet isn't my number one priority right now because I am a real estate investor and that's what my priority is. So I sacrifice sleep now to stay up late and look at properties and evaluate properties, underwrite them and do things like that. Whereas before baseball was cut and dry. It's like eat, sleep, train, repeat. Like I, it's not negotiating. It's just moving important things into the right slot now. 
Well, I really appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you sharing your story. And for those of you guys who are interested in following Ryan Healy's tar- story, where can you, they find you? What socials are you on? Um, how can they follow your journey? Uh, you can find me on Instagram. I can't say I'm the most active user, but I do plan to be a little bit more present on there with the YouTubes and, and such. But I think something you said to me, too, is you wanted to have a story to tell that was worth telling before you know, you share it with the world. And uh, that's what I'm working on. I'm finding things and trials and tribulations. I'm going to have a lot to share. That's going to be for sure. But RC Healy 7, um, you can find me or RC Healy 25 actually on, on Instagram. Best place to follow me. Right. And we got a YouTube video out with him right now. And there'll be another one coming out soon. And guys, appreciate you. Make sure you follow. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you share. And if you guys want to get started in real estate, you need a mentor, you need a coach, you need somebody that can has been there, somebody who's Seeing what you're going to see, someone to see around the corner, schedule a free call with my, me and my team. We'll include a link in the bio and a link in the description, and we'll check you in the next one. Did you ever want to invest in real estate? Did you ever want to live the life of your dreams? Did you want financial freedom? Did you want to break the generational curse? Did you want to help your parents out? Did you want to help your mom out? Maybe you work for a job that you don't like. You know, they say there's only one reason to work a job and that's to learn, right? If you're not learning at your job, you're just going through the motions, right? We have a free Facebook group, the Millionaire Mentorship Facebook group for real estate investing. Make sure you join, the link is in the description. If you want to schedule a free call with me and my team and you actually want to start, I would suggest you do so. We have helped hundreds of people change their lives and all they had to do was get started. They booked a call with me and my team and they got the ball rolling. And I'm so confident that if you don't get your first or next investment property within the first 90 days, you don't pay and I'll give you $1,000 cash. That's how confident I am. Obviously, you got to take action. You can't just do nothing and expect that to happen. But that's life. Life's all about taking action. Make sure you give this podcast a five-star review, share it with a friend and take action. 